great to be here. Thank you again for the invitation. It's fantastic to know that there are such a community exists, and uh, I'm already experienced the amount of support that this community provides to the, the members. So it's uh, it's really super to be here today. Um, yeah. So today I'm going to talk to you about neuroinflammation. So inflammation of the central nervous system, inflammation in the brain and the spinal cord. And um, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that we have been doing over the course of the past few years uh, across various chronic pain conditions, including fibromyalgia. And hopefully, by the end of the talk, I will have convinced you that uh, you know enough uh, evidence starts accumulating that brain inflammation is something that uh, we should be um, you know, considering when we look for uh, novel means of treating fibromyalgia. So, okay, so this is the outline of, of the talk. Essentially, what I'm gonna talk to you about is, first of all, an introduction to neuroinflammation. What is neuroinflammation, very briefly? And then, uh, why is it relevant to pain? And why we think it's relevant to pain? And I add a maybe, because we don't know to what extent, until, at least until recently, we didn't know to what extent it would be relevant to pain. And even now, there's a lot of open question. Uh, then I'm going to tell you how can we see new information? How can we visualize image new information in uh, uh, people? And then perhaps the most important question is, do we see information in uh, humans, in people that uh, have uh, chronic pain conditions, including fibromyalgia and other conditions? And finally, uh, the big so what question, what are the potential clinical implications? If we do see inflammation, what does it mean? Okay, so very simply, what is neuroinflammation? Very, neuroinflammation is an inflammatory response within the brain and or the spinal cord, essentially within the central nervous system. Uh, just like everywhere else in the body uh, where you can develop an inflammatory response, uh, well, you can also have an inflammation in the brain or in the spinal cord, um, except that the me main cellular player, the key cellular player, are a little bit different. In the brain, we always want to think about brain and spinal cord, we think about neurons, but there is a lot of other cells uh, that are called glial cells. You'll hear things like microglia, astrocytes, so essentially non-neuronal cells in the brain and the spinal cord. Those are the so-called glial cells. Glia, actually the name glia comes from uh, uh, the ancient Greek for for, um, for glue. And this is because in the past we thought those cells were just uh, providing support to uh, the neurons. They were kind of minor player. But actually, uh, over the course of the past couple of decades, we now know that those cells actually do much more than that. In fact, those are the immune cells of the central nervous system. So uh, we briefly talked about what is neuroinflammation, but what causes it? Well, we can see neuroinflammation across many different uh, conditions and situations in life. Uh, neurodegenerative disorders are accompanied by brain inflammation. Aging, aging itself is accompanied by uh, inflammation, autoimmunity, uh, exposure to pollution and toxic metabolites, and of course injuries and, and viral and bacterial infections. You know, we hear a lot about viral infections the past couple of years with COVID. So all of these things are thought to be uh, and likely to be accompanied by uh, brain inflammation. But is it good or bad? So if all these things induce inflammation, is inflammation, the brain inflammation, uh, 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 positive or, 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 or negative? Well, so as many things in life, it really depends it, in the acute context. So when it, it happened essentially right after a pathological or pathogenic event, let's say there is an invading uh, virus, right? Well, in that case, uh, it's actually very helpful because it allows the identification of the potentially harmful event, in that case, the viral infection, and it limits its impact. And also it, it, it favor healing and, 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 and repairs any damage. The problem is that unfortunately, inflammation sometimes can become chronic, can outlast the originating event, or can be exaggerated. So it can be too strong, okay, too widespread. In this case, new inflammation that's the case in which neuroinflammation becomes a problem in itself. And in fact, um, excessive neuroinflammation is, uh, is increasingly linked to a, a number of disorders, a number of conditions that go from neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's or ALS to conditions such as uh, you know, psychiatric conditions, uh, maybe even autism, etc. 
and, and also pain condition. This is where my lab is trying to figure out to what extent neuroinflammation has a role in pain. Uh, is neuroinflammation then relevant to pain? Well, why are we even thinking that neuroinflammation might have a role in, in pain, right? Well, so in animal studies, really uh, the answer, well, um, and literally hundreds of animal studies are showing that uh, glial cells are involved, are really key cells, key um, cells that um, um, for the establishment or even the maintenance of persistent pain. If you take an animal, okay, and you injure it, and you look at the spinal cord, for instance, but you can also look it up the brain, okay? But in this case, I'm showing you a, a, an image of a spinal cord. You can actually see cells like microglia, but also uh, astrocytes are capable of detecting the presence of this lesion. There is this alarm system going off, okay? And these cells are able to get all excited and, 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 uh, and acknowledge this. And when they do that, they start, as I was saying, getting excited and, and they undergo a series of responses produce a series of responses which collectively we call glial activation. Essentially, this is a form of neuroinflammation. And when neuroinflammation happens, the cells start producing inflammatory substances that essentially sensitize the brain, sensitize the spinal cord. And now a painful stimulus that was a little bit painful become very, very painful, or maybe something that was not painful at all becomes painful. And so it makes sense for us to look at pain uh, in, in the role of glial cells in pain. The problem is that in humans, uh, we don't even know to what extent uh, neuroinflammation is linked to pain. Now, all this beautiful work in animal models is really promising, right? So we know that when uh, glial cells become activated, when neuroinflammation happens, uh, animals start uh, becoming, it starts showing this pain behavior, right? And if you block these responses, for instance, with drugs, there are some drugs, but also other mechanisms, uh, well, the animal, animal's pain behavior can be reduced. So good news, maybe we can use this same strategy, you know, target neuroinflammation in humans with chronic pain, right? But the problem, we don't know to what extent neuroinflammation happens in chronic pain. Certainly, until recently, there was very, very scant information about that. And we wanted to do that. We wanted to look at to what extent neuroinflammation has a role in pain. So the question is, okay, so we wanna find out whether neuroinflammation happens in a patient with uh, chronic pain conditions, including fibromyalgia and other conditions. How do we do that? Well, one way of doing it, and uh, this is a, a very active area of investigation. There are, you know, there's a lot of interest in this. Again, because of, I was telling you before that neuroinflammation can be considered uh, a contributing factor to many, many, many different conditions, right? So um, there are many, um, there's a lot of uh, attempts to try to figure out new ways, but currently, possibly the best way we have is to image so to visualize the presence in the body using technique that I'm gonna talk to you about, of the presence of this uh, protein, which is called the translocator protein, or TSPO. You'll hear the name TSPO. Why do we think it's, uh, it's, it's a good idea to use TSPO to track TSPO and image TSPO to study your information? Well, this is because the level of this protein in the healthy central nervous system are very low very low level, you don't see a lot of it. But when there is neuroinflammation, then this uh, protein becomes much more present in the brain and spinal cord, okay? It, it increases its level. And the cells that tend to increase these levels most are uh, glial cells, like astrocytes and microglia. And of course the reason why I'm talking to you is because this protein uh, not only is increasing neuroinflammation, but also we can image it using a uh, technique which is called positron emission tomography. Uh, many of you will, will have heard of it. Uh, uh, PET is often used clinically, um, you know, to diagnose a, a number of disorders, and and it requires the injection of what we call the radio ligand. So essentially, it's a you know it's a little solution that goes and binds and go and finds the TSPO in your body, and because that. Uh, lig ligand is not a simple ligand, but it's a radio ligand, has a little bit of radioactivity attached to it. We can detect, we can see where how it distributes in the body. And so that's how we can image the presence of TSPO. That's how we can image the presence of neuroinflammation in uh, humans. And this is just a, a uh, little sampling menu <laughs> of uh, various studies using TSPO imaging in different
patient population, patient population such as multiple sclerosis, Huntington disease, and neuromuscular disorders such as uh, Lou Gehrig's disease or, or, or ALS. And we see that all of these conditions, in all of these conditions, we are able to detect the presence of elevated signal. Of course, it's not at all near information means uh, the same thing all, uh, in all conditions, right? So uh, it's not that because I might have inflammation because brain inflammation because of my uh, chronic pain, then it means that, you know, I have ALS, right? So it's not, not the case. I just want also to stress that. But what I want to show you here is that if you um, image all these different patient population, you're actually able to see elevation in this marker, this signal being elevated in the brains of these patients, exactly where you expect to find the inflammation to be and the pathology to be. For instance, you'll see it in uh, um, the MS lesions in patient multiple, multiple sclerosis. In uh, regions, in patients with Huntington disease, you see regions such as the basal ganglia, which are regions that are very important for, um, very key for Huntington disease. Yeah, well, that's where we see inflammation. In ALS, which is characterized by uh, neurodegeneration of uh, uh, motor neurons, so the neurons that are responsible for movement, well, we see it in the motor areas. So it makes sense. So hopefully these slides convince you that, you know, this imaging modality can really uh, teach us something about neuroinflammation. So the question is, okay, so now what if we image with the same modality, now chronic pain patients? We started with a chronic low back pain. That was the first study that, that we published, and that was uh, published in the journal Brain in uh, 2015. And we immediately saw that patients with chronic back pain had a lot of signal, especially in a part of the brain called the thalamus, which is, it, it's, you, can, you can see that as a, the sensory gateway uh, to the brain. So our, most of the sensory information, including those from pain, uh, get relayed from the peripheral, from the body, to the brain through the thalamus, okay? And we see this signal very elevated, to be very elevated in the thalamus. But these are just group images, okay? So this is essentially essentially, if you can think about it, essentially an average, right? It's a, really it's a medium, but it's a similar concept of a number of, of patients and the average of their controls. And they look quite similar. And this was quite striking. However, what really was very much more controls, the healthy volunteers that are controls, essentially they are matched to the patient by essentially as the same sex, uh, similar age, etc. You, uh, has very little signal. You are, are you able to tell me who's the patient who's the control just by looking at these images. And uh, um, we we were we got pretty excited also because, as you know, there isn't such a biomarker for for pain. Right? You probably don't know that right now I have a bit of uh, neck pain, and the reason why you know is because I decided to tell you. And of course, uh, this is why. Uh, um, patient fibromyalgia, uh, this, this is how patient fibromyalgia express their pain, right? They talk to the physician and say, well, I have a pain, and maybe it's a four out of 10, it's a, and, and you know, who knows? Uh, is it really a four out of 10? Is it six, is it a two? Uh, it's a very imprecise and, and subjective measurement. So for us to be able to see something that was so visible in all patients was exciting. In addition, of course, to uh, providing evidence of the main finding, which is that, that there is new information, which is, uh, Perhaps even more important. So uh, you know, as uh, we hope that we are good scientists. So as good scientists, we always want to make sure that uh, this is not a fluke. This is not just you know luck. You know, maybe we just got lucky. We scanned some patients uh, or whatever they were, and all of them had a lot of signal. But just for fun, not just for fun, just for luck. <laughs> and so we decided to restart from scratch. We repeated the whole study. We recruited more patients, more controls, and again we saw the same effects. Again, the thalamus was very, very hot in the patient's compared to the control. And then on top of it, that's an interesting observation. We found that in some part of the brain, particularly a brain a region which is called the primary somatosensory region, we found that this signal uh, was higher in patients. Again, we are talking about back pain patients, right? But was higher in the patients that also have higher symptoms that resemble fibromyalgia. The more, the higher was the score on the fibromyalgia survey, 
uh, more fibromyalgia like the symptom were, the higher was the signal. So that was an interesting observation. So then the question is, well, do people with fibromyalgia have new inflammation? And of course, you know, we were wondering, you know, did we just get lucky uh, uh, to identify a phenomenon uh, in uh, the, the only patient population that shows this effect? Or maybe we see it elsewhere, right? And there, there is some reason to look at fibromyalgia um, and other conditions. I just wanted to show this picture of Eva. So Eva Kosak, um, for those of you who might not know her, she's a great scientist um, at Karolinska Institute. And the study uh, that I'm about to talk to you about uh, is um, was, an, was a collaboration with Eva. And the way this collaboration was actually uh, was born was actually quite interesting because we were both at a conference. I think she came to visit a poster from one of my trainees. We were probably talking about this TSPO imaging, I think maybe in back pain. And, and uh, I think I, I told her, you know what, we're doing this in fibromyalgia now. You know, it's exc I'm excited to see if we can see that in fibromyalgia as well. And she told me, oh, you know what, we're doing the same study. So uh, it's a collaboration, but not planning in advance. So, you know, at the beginning for the uh, subsequent couple of weeks and months, there was a little bit of a dance, you know, try to figure out whether, hey, what are you guys are doing? Are you guys close to publishing? Do we have similar results? Except, but then in the end, we decided it's kind of silly. Let's do a bigger study. Let's harmonize the, 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 the study. And let's do a single study combining all the data so that we can actually see if what we see in Boston are the same things that she sees in Stockholm and publish a stronger papers, a stronger paper. And I think um, we are both very excited that we did that. Um, you know, to, to, to give a little bit of an example of how sometimes uh, science uh, happens uh, a lot by happenstance. But you know, this is a two-side study, but as you can see, uh, retrospectively. <laughs> And so, um, bottom line, you know, these pictures, you know, the details don't matter, but this picture show that yes, in fibromyalgia, we did see elevation in the, in the TSPO signal, that is a marker of neuroinflammation. We think we identify neuroinflammation in the brains of patient fibromyalgia. It's very interesting that is very different, it looks different than a simple back pain, okay? It's widespread. As a, as a, it looks quite different in the, in the brain uh, um, compared to a patient with the back pain, as I'll show also other conditions. So it's interesting how uh, what it might be happening is that um, TSP elevation and neuroinflammation might, yes, occur across multiple different conditions, but each of us might have a different, or each type of condition at least might have, be accompanied by a different, what I call neuroimmune signature. And we can talk a little bit more about it later. And yeah, this is what I wanted to show is that we, if you take four uh, regions, you know, the, the names and the specifics don't, don't matter. One is called S1, one is called the LPFC, one is called Procurance, et cetera. But if you see on the left and on the right, you can see how both in the, the MGH, in the Boston cohorts, and on the right in the Karolinska, in the Stockholm cohorts, we saw essentially the same effects elevated in all those regions. The patients that show elevated signal in all those regions compared to controls. So seeing the same thing across both sides of, of the Atlantic, I think was an important validation, especially nowadays that there is a, a replication crisis in, in science, um, whereby you, you see something, you get excited, and then you know, nobody else replicated. So this was an important point of this paper. Another point that I want to, to, to stress is that we did find that in some regions, uh, the amount of uh, TSPO signal, the level of the signal, actually was correlated with the amount of fatigue experienced by the patient. So patients that reported a lot of fatigue had a lot of TSPO signal, a lot of PET signal, and patients had less, had less. So you can kind of see how uh, there is a, a link to the symptoms. Um, and then the last thing that I want to mention about this study is that in addition to uh, this imaging that we did at both sides, at Karolinska, they also scanned patients with this other uh, PET radio ligand that allowed them to see specifically the astrocytes. Remember, I was telling you before that TSPO is increased by activated microglia and maybe also astrocytes. So when you look at uh, elevation in TSPO, you can say, well, you know, it's glial activation, but you might, you don't know to what extent it's microglia, to what extent astrocytes. Well, if you look at uh, what 
look like the effects of astrocytes, a, a more specific effect on astrocytes, you don't see difference between patients and controls. What that suggests, again, we don't know this to be absolutely certain, but what this at least suggests is that it's really, what we are all seeing is not an effect of astrocytes, but it's really the effect of microglia that is driving this. Um, uh, yeah, I think we can quickly glance through all of this, but essentially also I wanted to mention that other conditions, in addition to back pain and fibromyalgia, um, have been studied by our, by, by our lab. And, and for instance, one, another condition that we show to be associated uh, with uh, uh, widespread brain uh, inflammation, in fact, looks quite a bit like fibromyalgia, it's Gulf War illness. So veterans from, especially the first Gulf War, uh, about 30% of them came back with uh, very um, medically unexplained musculoskeletal disorders, difficulty concentration, concentrating, unrefreshing sleep, uh, cognitive issues and fiber fog, etc. Does it sound familiar? Well, yeah, from a standpoint of clinical presentation, it does have at least some features of the symptoms expressed by, experienced by patients with fibromyalgia. And so we say, well, you know, we saw inflammation in that condition, maybe go for illness is also accompanied by uh, neuroinflammation. And, and this is what we saw. This was a collaboration with Kim Salo and Bill. And very quickly, if you don't mind advancing, we also saw, yeah, in, in migraine, with links to the number of migraine attacks per month. So the higher the signal, the more uh, migraine attacks per month. And you could go to the next one. Uh, this was in collaboration with Nushina Jukani. And then um, uh, this is uh, one of the work where we're trying to ask an additional interesting question. For instance, well, can the TSPO signal be a predictor of what happens in the future? So if we take patient with a total knee replacement, scan them before the surgery, can we say, well, you know, based on what I'm seeing in the scan before the surgery, these three patients will unfortunately experience persistent pain after surgery, and these other 19 or 50, they will not. And, you know, data is preliminary, but we are seeing something along those lines. And the picture that you see below with the karate gear, this is Zainab Alshel, was a, a postdoc in my lab. She did a lot of great work, and that's what she looks like when she... Uh, fights her opponents. She was actually um, a national, Australian national champion in her category for karate. So she's, she's not somebody to meddle with. <laughs> and just to conclude, uh, as I hope I showed you, individuals that experience chronic pain, including fibromyalgia, including back pain, gulf war illness, etc., demonstrate TSPO signal elevation because we think that TSPO signal is a marker of inflammation. Well, we think that fibromyalgia and other conditions uh, do uh, exhibit brain inflammation. And, uh, and as I also mentioned, neuroinflammatory signal in different regions appear to be linked to different symptoms. And, uh, um, and I, you know, um, maybe you can just skip to the next one. You know, the big question is, well, so what, right? Uh, well, I think there is two main um, implications. So one is, well, this maybe can lead to the development of, of novel therapies. I mean, it's not that this our idea that you know we had we 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 got in the vacuum. There's a, a lot of uh, you know uh, you know people expect the new information might be part of uh, of these conditions. However, until you see it, you know you don't get the big pharma <laughs> to invest a lot of money developing this this uh, therapies. This this my my take. So I'm hoping that this work really moves the need moves the needle and and it motivates really to uh, invest a lot of. Uh, funding for for the development of uh, novel therapy that potentially based uh, um, you know uh, focused on neuroinflammation, and then again you know the other implication is really the, the ability to potentially we're not there yet but identify a pain biomarkers. You know uh, we talk a lot about how you know uh, conditions such as fibromyalgia, but even Gulf War illness, and other conditions. There are always um, you know obviously uh, there's always stigmatized. There's a lot of they're always stigmatized. Um, many patients are not taken seriously. Are you really having pain? Uh, well, you know, having something that can objectively show that there is something there can also help that. So that's why we are excited for this work. And I think the next slide is only for thank you. So yeah, absolutely. So my lab, this is now uh, a fraction of what it became. Unfortunately, grew well. No, for sure. Fortunately, grew uh, <laughs> quite, quite a bit. Um, uh, and also my headaches a little bit, and that's uh, that's why I have a little bit more white hair than I had a couple of years ago. <laughs> uh, but they're really a fantastic group. I'm so 
blessed to work with them and I'm so uh, also grateful for the invitation and thank you so much for for listening perfect I I'm I'm loving the information and I know that everybody enjoyed the discussion when we talk about this because you mentioned it with some of this validation being dismissed uh, within fibromyalgia but all of the new research coming in and what we can move forward so what is the neuroinflammation look research look like moving forward good question so um well, there's a couple of things that we are doing. So first of all, we're trying to, once we see the signal, okay, we see these beautiful pictures, well, can we do anything with that, right? So, and as part of that, we're trying to see, can we use this information to, for instance, predict for surgical pain or predict how people will feel in the future? Or can we then treat, start treating people with medication that are thought to, uh, you know, affect uh, neuroinflammation? So we have a couple of trials not currently not in fibromyalgia, no, although I know that other groups are working on it, uh, with uh, things like, you know, CBD and, and also um, uh, non, uh, we have just concluded a clinical trial using a medication, which is actually an antibiotic, it's called minocycline, that is very commonly used as a microglial inhibitor. We don't know to what extent it really inhibits inflammation in the brains of humans, uh, but there is a lot of evidence from preclinical studies that it would, so we are testing this out. Um, and we're also testing the effect of uh, non-pharmacological interventions, uh, such as um, uh, meditation, uh, such as um, transcutaneous vagus nerve stimulation, etc. And then, you know, of course, there is the development of novel ways of imaging inflammation. We're trying to look for um, methods not to have to do PET, which is expensive <laughs> and, and cannot be done in many places around the world. Ideally, we will identify something that can then be applied to, you know, maybe just simple MRI that you find at your hospital instead of having a super swanky uh, PET MRI. So well, this I that's what was that's what was leading into sort of my next question because people were asking in the chat and I just want to highlight your presentation and thank you because everybody enjoyed it here and we have um, different people chiming in. So thank you so much for all that information. I want to be sure to share and celebrate that and all the fantastic information that's coming from the comments too. Thank you so much. Um, but I, I noticed for some of the questions coming up too, because you're mentioning the different equipment. So this is not available, just to clarify, correct? In clinical care, you'd have to go to a brain imaging center, go to your center to be involved with research, correct? That's right. That's right. This is not something that you know is is approved for clinical care. Uh, in fact, you know these are really the first studies, right? In it, in their kind. So in order even for us to know that this is clinically valuable we have to do much more right so we are really at the forefront we are we're doing the first studies and hopefully this will lead somewhere uh, but right now it's all experimental and uh, i hope that in five years i will tell you you know we were right we also hope in maybe even faster. So with that said, and we appreciate your time and we want to honor your time so much, but how can we support your research as patient community? So first of all, I want to say something that we study patients with the different conditions and, you know, not only patient, you know, individuals from all walk of life, etc. And I want to say thank you to the community because specifically the community the fibromyalgia community is so motivated so willing to really uh do anything that you know is needed to really try to understand it so i just wanted to say that <laughs> to begin with and so please continue to do that uh what you know uh, what can be done well you know um research for uh funding for research for pain research has been improved over the course of the past few years, but it's not, not, not you know, nothing uh, really uh, comparable to other research and other conditions. So, you know, of course, if there was a way to support more studies, they would be fantastic. Also, fibromyalgia is one of those things that it's tough to get funded for. So uh, there is not many institutes at, 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 at NIH, for instance, that clearly, clearly support um, research on fibromyalgia. 
So if there was opportunities to, I don't know, identify funding mechanism, maybe to fund maybe trainees that study in laboratories to understand better fibromyalgia or even fun food studies, that would be super. Um, so that's well, what I'm I would say. I'm going to take that information because we are working. We launched the advocacy program, so we've done multiple trips to Capitol Hill. We've been doing virtual with our representatives to increase funding at the NIH, but also just contribute to funding and support funding and research. I, that's why we invite our researchers to come and share with us the research they're doing, because sometimes there's a disconnect with the community, and they don't feel like anyone's doing research behind the scenes, so we love sharing it, and then we love returning it and going all the way through all the research so that's why doing this and sharing the published research and what's ahead um, and supporting your work is very important for our community and our organization thank you so much for doing that thank you so much for your time um, I appreciate you being here and so we are we're excited we're gonna add all the links and make sure everybody stays connected we're gonna learn more about your cookbook um do you mind sharing briefly about the cookbook <laughs> yeah sure um yes i'm getting more emails about uh suggestion on how to cook that uh ragu that than, than for scientific collaboration lately <laughs> so yeah it was in the in the midst of uh of the lockdown and uh, you know we were we we're very um, you know socially isolated all of us uh, you know we are in the San Martino Center for Biomedical Imaging which is the center within Mass General which is where my lab is currently hosted is hosted um, you know where you know about a hundred you know probably a couple of hundreds of people right but and so we used to kind of see each other and and see each other often and but of course everything uh, fell apart during the lockdown so at one point I saw you know you know we don't invite each other for dinner anymore, so why don't we start, you know, taking a picture or a video of us take, you know, cooking something? And you know, Martino Center about seventy percent are actually come from outside of the U.S., so there's a lot of, you know, different uh, talents, different different, you know, uh, cultures, uh, right? So why don't we do that? So I, I took a video. I think my wife was taking a video of me preparing a uh, Italian uh, meat sauce. Uh, it's called ragu. And uh, you know, I shared it, and then people got excited. So I got Lebanese friends sending their own video, and then the French friends in their own video. And then at one point, I said, "Hey, why don't we make a uh, cookbook?" And then this became a cookbook, and the director of the center contributed, and uh, so it's it's fantastic. So glad with you. Well, fabulous! I know we'll share the links with our community. Thank you again for joining us, and we're going to continue with our programming. So thank you. We'll tune in and check in on your research soon. Bye.